Today, I'm joined by James DeVolos, Portfolio Manager at the Horizon Kinetics Inflation Beneficiary Fund. James, great to have you on Forward Guidance. Really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. The inflation is what I think is the biggest uh, theme right now. I think it could be the biggest story going forward. Uh, we just had inflation hit a 30-year high for uh, last month. My question for you is how does that uh, you know, impact the investment landscape? A lot of people maybe think, okay, inflation means when I go to the store, milk is more expensive, but doesn't really imp impact the stock market. Why is that view completely wrong? So I think you need to really break it down into two different areas that it affects. It affects, A, the fundamentals of the companies and their profit margins, uh, but also it affects all financial assets because if inflation results in higher interest rates, that's effectively gravity on all financial assets. So I'll approach the former first, which is that it's pretty easy to just analyze a company in terms of inflation and say, hey, the, this is a great product, great business. They can push on three, four, five percent costs to their customers, no problem. Great company. The problem is they then also have two main expense items, one being cost of goods sold. So do their chips cost more? Do their materials cost more? Do their facilities cost more? The other blind item that is probably just about to start hitting CPI is labor, so your SG&A expenses. Um, but then the other one that people really don't talk about nearly enough is their CapEx. So investing two years ago, you can earn a much higher return on invested capital than buying in at prices in some industries 20, 30, 40% higher. So where do profit margins go? Now, to, to address the latter item, which is interest rates, let's assume your profit margin, so your free cash flow is compressed or even declining. At the very least, your growth rate is stunted due to these inflationary factors. Now add in the fact that your multiple on your stock goes down because of higher interest rates. So this could be a really tricky environment for all financial assets. I mean, the, the most sensitive, it would be really long duration bonds, so 30 plus year bonds. But if you look at the cash flow profile of these rev or profitless tech stocks and then kind of sensitize that to interest rates, they're as much or more sensitive to movements in rates than even the long bond. So, the, yeah, uh, inflation is essentially kryptonite to long bonds because uh, bonds have a fixed coupon for over the next 30 years. And if what you're being paid in in the coupon is itself being debased via inflation, if the value is being eroded, then the value of that bond is going to be much, much less. Why is it that these uh, technology companies or let's say these growth stocks where it's, it's sort of pie in the sky, you know, companies that are really focused on revenue in 10 years rather than companies that are focused on profit yeah. now, how come those are most susceptible to inflation? So, I mean, let's just give a really easy example. Let's say you own a company that is an apartment building and you're getting all of your rent every month. So you, the, you have less of a discounting factor on that rent because it's up front. It's, it's fully loaded up front. You're getting money in your pocket every month. So if you're discounting that, at, let's say, let's use a really high discount rate, 15%. You're not as sensitive. I mean, of course you are, but you're not as sensitive because you have cash coming in every day as you go out a month, a year, five years, 10 years. If you have one of these platform, I'd say um, extremely optimistically uh, valued long duration tech stocks, you have zero or negative cash flow to put in your pocket for maybe as much as 10, 15, 20 years. So by definition, all of the value is out 20 years, 10 years, whatever it may be. So you're that much more sensitive to that discount rate. So you know, $100 today might be is it worth $100. Depending on your discount rate, $100 10, 20 years in the future could be worth as little as $15. Right. So if the rate of uh, debasement is higher, then the money in the future is not worth it, what it is now. Uh, so if that's the, the assets that are bad for uh, that, uh, that hurt from inflation is, is bonds and long duration stocks, what are companies that benefit from that? You're the portfolio manager of INFL, Inflation Beneficiaries Fund, where you're not just trying to hedge inflation, you're actually trying to benefit from inflation. So how do you do that? Like, what, what is the motivating principle for your fund? So I, I think the first thing we do is we try to identify what, what are tangible, finite, high quality assets. We call them hard assets because you really need something that can inflate in value as a function of inflation. So historically, this would be everything from different types of commodities, real estate, infrastructure, 
something that you can pick up or kick. Um, but the problem with a lot of those businesses is that they're very capital intensive. So you use you spend a lot of money to make money, uh, but then also you have a lot of debt financing. So we identify these these assets that we think will go up in value, but then we overlay a critical business analysis, which is called capital light, meaning these companies give you access to these inflationary markets, but in a capital light business model. So you don't have you're not subject to a lot of the volatility and the risk that is part and parcel of investing in some of kind of the, the old economy type of upstream uh, investments in these types of sectors. So companies that are able to pass on inflation to their consumers, what are those sorts of companies and why is it that they can pass on the cost and others can't? Again, this is really important. I think a commodity company. So obviously oil is in the news today. Gas is in the news today. We had a SPR release yesterday and lo and behold, energy prices went up. So everybody who went to the gas tank a year ago versus today is paying a lot more money. All else equal, you would say energy companies can pass on that expense, which they can. And I agree with that. The problem is oil field service costs. So the costs to drill, complete and service wells have not really gone up yet. Labor costs have not really gone up yet. So their margins are probably at all time high in these capital intensive businesses. So you need to look at the revenue side and the expense side. And then also, as I mentioned before, the CapEx side. If you were a CFO of an oil company a year ago looking at $40 oil, you know, you were tickled thinking about the different acquisitions you could make. Today, if you're pricing in 80 plus for oil, it's a lot trickier. So those businesses might do fine. I think a lot of them are cheap enough, and we can talk about this later, why, that you'll probably do okay. But we want to focus on businesses that are capital light, so the revenue goes up without a commensurate rise in expenses. Ideally, you want revenue going up with vi virtually no uh, variable expense, expense structure. So we call this operating leverage or scale. And I think that that's going to be the critical differentiator in this inflation cycle to make money in equities versus stand still or do just fine. Let's zoom out for a second, James, and talk about the macro picture. Inflation first appeared on the scene in, in February uh, and March, and it was at 2 3%. And then people were saying base effects. Then people were saying, oh, it's only because of used cars. It continued to creep uh, steadily higher up until we had a 6.2% yearly rise in the uh, in the CPI um, for last year. And there are now, now a lot of elements are really coming to, to the foray in terms of housing, uh, in, in terms of labor. Why do you think inflation is happening? Um, and why do you think it will continue? I think that looking at historical inflation analogs is dangerous because even though it's a very dangerous word to use, but this time is different. And the reason it's different is that you've had a ton of monetary policy that has suppressed rates for over a decade. Combine that with unprecedented fiscal policy, meaning government spending during and after COVID and with more in the future. And then the third arrow is going to be is the fact that we have underinvested in a lot of these physical economy markets for the better part of seven, 10 years. And so all of these things coalescing are going to create an incredibly different investment environment for the next 10 years as compared to the prior 10 years. And we're trying to capture the companies that we think are going to be the best risk adjusted beneficiaries of this different trend. One of the biggest reasons that inflation and gradual debasement, certainly asset inflation has been taking place for the better part of the last decade is that we've kept interest rates at extremely low levels. And uh, the very short term, so the overnight rate has been negative in real terms, meaning it's below the rate of inflation for basically the entire decade. Um, now you're seeing 10 year bonds that are highly negative in terms of your real yield. So a 160 10 year bond versus 6% inflation, you know, you're netting almost 5% negative real rate of return. Um, so as a result of that, you've seen a lot of misallocation of capital and a lot of asset inflation because basically you need something productive to put the assets into. And this monetary phenomenon, meaning suppressed low interest rates, has been going on a really long time. With COVID, you've kind of dumped gasoline on the slow burning fire with adding fiscal stimulus. And this is important because all of these people that have worried about inflation and debasement over this cycle have kind of been faked out because you haven't seen monetary aims end up in the real economy, end up in CPI and PPI. 
now you have an already fragile structure because of monetary policy, expensive assets, scarce assets, and now you're basically putting all this money in the system to go out and go into productive uses and buy it. So money supply is 40% higher than it was going into COVID. The final variable, which really the trifecta of why I think inflation is going to be such an issue, is that now you've got this perfect harmony of monetary at the lower bound meeting unprecedented fiscal, but we also have supply shortages from 10, 15, 20 years of underinvestment or malinvestment in a lot of the critical supply uh, materials for the physical economy. So copper, iron, oil, gas, gold, silver, um, all of these areas, you just haven't seen the requisite investment, especially if a, a lot of this fiscal policy is going to be oriented towards infrastructure, which is very intensive in all of these markets. So I think that this is going to take a very, very long time for itself to, to sort itself out. And that's why it puts me firmly in the, the secular or structural, not transitory camp. That third point you noted, the supply chain issue, James, a lot of people are saying that that really shouldn't count, that, oh, uh, you know, there's there's a crisis in our supply chains, so the prices are temporarily elevated, but you really shouldn't count it because of the supply chains. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Like, let's say that there's a disease that kills most of the cows in the United States, so the price of milk goes to $8 a gallon. Like, that is due to supply chains, but do, do you view that, that that shouldn't count because it's of supply chain, you know? So I think there are things that will be worked out. So used cars are not going to go up 30% a year. Microprocessors, they're going to basically build more of those. Things like that are going to basically balance itself out because there it, it's, a, it's a market that can add supply pretty quickly. There's plenty of fabs that can go up in Southeast Asia and build microprocessors. The cars are sitting on the lots that basically just need a couple parts to come back into the market. But then that's a very different dynamic than adding 10 million barrels of oil supply a day. Because, yes, shale can, get, can come online very quickly. But if you look outside of U.S. and OPEC investment, there's, we're basically we're down 70, 80 percent from peak levels of capital expenditures in a lot of these other types of projects. Copper is another good example. The IEA released a, port, a report saying to bring a new large-scale greenfield, meaning from scratch, not a brownfield expansion project in copper, takes 15 years. When you look at the past 15 years or so, you've seen just under and mal investment really highlighted in the last four to five years in energy. Uh, and a lot of these projects, it's not shale, which is very short cycle. You can get a shale well online fairly quickly. Infrastructure is a bit longer dynamic, but when you look at the big projects that add a lot of barrels, very long term, offshore platforms, North Sea, ultra deep water Gulf of Mexico, off of South America, the capex just isn't there. And so when you look at the plug factor, what's OPEX max production, what's U.S. shale max production, there's a huge plug variable that just isn't there. And these projects take years, if not decades, to come online. Similarly, the IEA released a report about the energy transition and how copper intensive it's going to be, saying that to get a new copper mine online, and this is a, a greenfield expansion from scratch, not a brownfield expansion, uh, will take 15 years. So you need permitting, planning, assuming you can get government approvals with everything that's going on with ESG, infrastructure, financing, basically all of that, you're 15 years away from getting first ore. So if we have trillions of dollars chasing copper, iron, nickel, zinc, oil, gas, all these things to do all these infrastructure projects in the physical economy, but we need we needed to start this CapEx 15 years ago, that's something that's going to take a heck of a long time to filter through the system. Uh, what do you think about housing? You know, owner shelter and, and owner occupied rent something that is it like is a comprises a third of the consumer price index, and we've seen it start to budge slightly up, but it's nowhere close to the you know yearly change in the actual price of housing. So a lot of people are, including the Dallas Fed, I have a paper from the Dallas Fed, um, speculating that that could uh, you know if the if the price of housing is going up X amount, the price you know rent will will follow uh, shortly. Um, what do you think about that? And then also, can, can you speak to just uh, how well do you think CPI captures real inflation? Yeah, and I think that's going to the two big stress points that are still coming down the pike for CPI. So uh, 
energy, you're coming off a higher base. You're not going to continue at this rate. Used cars, you're coming off a higher base. You're not going to keep at this rate. Agriculture and food, I'm not so convinced we're going to slow down on. Uh, and we can kind of go into that a little bit later. But the areas where we still have yet to see the full impact are wages and housing. So as you mentioned, the CPI uses owner equivalent rent. And you know, I've looked at the formulas. I can't figure out how they're getting a number so low because I moved out of New York City during COVID because I had a, a one had one year old daughter who's now almost three and ran to the suburbs like everybody else. And in all of these cities just north of New York City and west of New York City, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, basically, if there is a rental available, and this has been the dynamic for years, you're basically willing to pay one and a half to twice what it would cost you in a mortgage to rent that house because of basically, you don't have to tie up that capital and there's that much more demand. Obviously, New York City is a very unique market where you're very dense living and the suburban kind of market was a little bit is a little bit different. But I'm hearing very similar stories in Chicago, Boston, Atlanta, Dallas, L.A. So I think the housing variable is going to really be a big factor going uh, coming up. But another thing, a lot of really brilliant investors were have been basically not getting any returns at all in a lumber and timber thesis for close to a decade saying, look, we worked through all the inventory in the housing crisis. We basically built, you know, maybe a 10th or 20% of what we needed for natural demand for a few years. Eventually we were going to have to basically match natural housing demand growth uh, with supply and it never happened. So again, similar to oil and gas, similar to copper, similar to gold and silver, We've got seven, eight, ten years of a backlog of underinvesting in new housing supply, and now all of a sudden people say, "Hey, I want these houses." James, let's now return to your core uh, investment thesis: how to invest so that you benefit from inflation. You want companies that can pass on the cost of inflation, but companies that aren't capital intensive, so they don't have to have other people pass the cost on to them. Uh, tell us about the, the different types of companies that you, you invest in. I guess we can start with the, the direct and indirect, and then we'll get into the, the sectors. Sure. So the, the two primary categories in the fund are in direct inflation beneficiaries and indirect inflation beneficiaries. There's a third bucket that's opportunistic, which is going to be a lot smaller because it's a bit uh, higher risk profile. But the commonality here is there's a lot of operating leverage and a lot of scale, minimal capital intensity, both working capital and balance sheet. But the direct beneficiaries have that direct pecuniary or financial interest in the hard asset. So think an oil royalty company or a precious metal streaming company or a land bank. Basically, they have a financial interest in the underlying asset, but with little to no variable expense. With a royalty, you're basically just cashing a check relative to the production and capex of other energy companies. Similar dynamic in, in, in um, gold and silver streams. If you're a landowner and you're just selling raw or slightly developed land, again, all of these examples, your margins can be upwards of 90%, gross margins that is. And so that's what we really want to capture here. But something you need to be careful with is you want a long duration or let me actually rephrase that. I don't want people to confuse that with interest rate sensitivity, yes. a long lived asset base. So for example, with energy royalties, 50, 60, 70 years of drilling inventory is ideal because you don't want to have to go out there and compete. Let's say in a big scenario, oil's at 150. It's going to be pretty tough to recycle your capital and go out and buy new land at $150 oil when we just came from $20 oil. So we really focus on that really long-lived asset base there. The indirect beneficiary is a lot of commonality with the first group, but the exposure to the inflationary uh, areas are indirect. So I think two really good examples. One would be a financial exchange. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange is the largest derivatives exchange in the world. Their main products are interest rates, currencies, commodities, and equity futures. So now just imagine CPI prints four, five, or six next year. Hard to imagine the 10 years is going to stay at 160. The volatility, both from speculators and hedging in both of those markets, the volume is going to explode. Plus, you don't get CPI at those levels without a heck of a lot of commodity movement. So how does an exchange make money? They're basically the toll booth on matching buyers and sellers. So more volume, more revenue, 
once you cover that fixed cost, which today is basically a computer mainframe, it's all free cash flow. Similar with brokerages. So the capital intensity of shipping, of insurance, or re commercial real estate. Great businesses, probably inflationary, but really capital intensive. Brokerages are such a great business because they're just volume times price. So a strong underwriting cycle, a strong shipping cycle, a strong leasing and real estate sales cycle, they're basically getting a revenue function of volume times price. Again, the brokers get paid, but then you all of your fixed cost is really sunk at that point, and then it's all scale after that. Yeah, I noted one of your holdings, um, CBRE, is, is a brokerage for commercial office buildings. Obviously, it's been a very tough time for commercial office buildings, but CBRE has actually done pretty well because they're on they're, uh, you know, the buyer and the seller and they're, they're, they're matching those two parties. Can you just, uh, explain your thinking a little bit on why inflation will create an environment where there are a lot of transactions? Like I would say we've been in a disinflationary decade over the past 10 years and brokerage firms have done pretty well, so they can do well in disinflationary times. Why do you think they'll do especially well in inflationary times? So I think that in an inflationary market, there's uncertainty. And another thing other than being in a deflate, disinflationary decade, we've been in a wildly suppressed volatility where I remember when 2020 VIX, the volatility index on the CBOE was normal. And for a lot of the past decade, we were 15, 16 or even less. And with more uncertainty, there's more transactions, certainly on financial exchanges, because Let's say you're a corporate treasurer or you're running an endowment or a foundation or even a large family office. You have to worry all of a sudden you have to worry about hedging out interest rates. You have to worry about hedging out your euros and pounds and yen where you could kind of be complacent about that. And all of that's volume. Similar with your cost of goods sold. Do you want to hedge out your exposure to oil if you're a plastics manufacturer or a petrochemical company? So, again, a more uncertainty means a lot more transactions, certainly on the exchange side. In terms of brokerages, right now in real estate, you're basically releasing half the country. So again, there's a lot more turnover uh, and people have basically been really happy to kind of just sit and collect checks and watch their property values go up. So I think there's going to be a lot more incentive to basically do dynamic things and transact. And so, again, I think a, a more uncertain world with as long as there's all this money flowing through the system, it all, points, it all points towards just more and more money flowing through the system. James, in inflationary times, the prices of commodities go up, uh, oil, gold, and the like. So a lot of people say, I want to own oil, own futures on oil, own futures on gold, or I want to own the gold miners. I want to own oil drillers. How come you want to uh, you fo focus instead on the royalty companies instead of, let's say, uh, the, the miners for, for gold? Or gold itself. Yeah. And I, th I think there's a really good example why this logic holds. So let's go back to the last peak in the gold spot market. It was about almost 10 years ago to the day in 2011. We were going back into QE in the U.S. There was all the peripheral European concerns with the Portugal, uh, Italy, Greece, Spain bonds. And basically it was a risk, risk off trade, get into gold. And it was up near 2000 an ounce. So through today, let's say you're down five or six percent in gold over the last decade. So pretty crummy experience in absolute terms. Throw in two percent inflation. It's a pretty miserable experience in real terms. But if you bought the large cap gold miners index, so the ETF is GDX, you're down over 55 percent. Flat gold, you're down 55 percent in the miners. If you bought the largest publicly traded gold royalty company, you're up over 250%. So in a flat market, you're doing incredibly well in the royalty, you're flat in the commodity, and you're cut in half in the miners. And it's all about risk. So the miners added CapEx at the top of the cycle. They had debt. They had higher break-evens. They had to delever. They had to sell assets at the bottom. By the way, I should mention gold went from 2000 to 1000 on its way back to 2000 today. So it wasn't just going nowhere for a decade. The royalties used no leverage. So they were able to buy assets on the cheap, but then they also benefit from this optionality whereby their existing portfolio, you have a royalty on a big mine, let's say in Peru. Instead of that mining company spending a lot of money to look for a speculative mine, let's say in some emerging market country, 
they're just going to expand their existing mine plan instead of actually going into a new expensive project. So you really benefit from that optionality on that side of the portfolio, on, on that side of the business. Yeah, and you know the, the uh, attraction of investing in a gold mining, uh, mining company at the bottom and then having it go 60x, that can be very alluring. But of course, you know, the, the, the Mark Twain saying that a gold mine is just a hole in the ground with a liar at the top, that is a saying for a reason. And often <laughs> investors can get burned, as you can see, if you look at the GDX or GDXJ. In fact, I know people who actually invest in gold miners for a living, often what they do is invest in the ones they like and then short the GDX because there's so many, you know, not so high quality companies uh, in there. James, uh, let's now re zoom out a little bit and talk about the disinflationary world that we've been in over the past 40 years, how we've been in a, a bull market in bonds, particularly you know, long term bonds over the past 40 over the same, same time period that in turn has fueled uh, you know, a, a speculative frenzy in stock has performed very well. And to what degree would you say that low inflation was responsible for all that? And can you, you know, describe perhaps the uh, portfolio allocation strategies such as 60-40, such as risk parity that were, uh, you know, took advantage of a disinflationary time? And uh, to what degree, if we're headed, as you perceive, into a uh, inflationary era, how investment thinking has to change? So I think this is a really interesting point here because... When I, was, when I was in undergrad, when I was in business school, basically finance 101 is that you hedge your stocks with your bonds and vice versa. So rising rates, good economy, stocks should do fairly well, but your bonds are going to get hit, risk off, bonds go up, stocks go down. This cycle, everything goes up. So your correlations are incredibly high. So you're not actually taking risk off the table. You're doubling down on that declining interest rate, disinflationary environment that you just mentioned. And so a lot of people have had these huge outsized returns in 6040 because the 10 year going from five or six pre, actually let's go back to the global financial crisis, when the 10 year was around six, down to, a, down to earlier in, in 2020, you were well below one. That just would cause huge capital gains in the bond side of the portfolio. Meanwhile, equities have soared on lower discount rates and risk embracing. So obviously, if they can suddenly go up together, they can also suddenly go down together. And I'm not sure that everybody fully appreciates that, especially in the, in the asset allocation world. So going forward, I think people really need to think through what could happen to their portfolio if rates go up, what could cause rates to go up, what could cause inflation to go up, and how is that going to impact on a bottom up? all of my companies and allocations, but also on a top down level. So the the difficulty level is going up exponentially from basically just, you know, riding a rising tide in basically all financial assets when correlations were up to the right. 60-40 is 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and they hedge each other. You know, since I think 1987, the correlation between stocks and bonds has been negative. Correlation between rates is, is a bit positive. So when rates go up, which are you know just the attributes of bonds, stocks go up too. Uh, and when rates go down, uh, stocks, stocks go down as well. But that might change. And investment strategies like 60-40 and risk parity, which is essentially a levered version of, of 60-40, have done very well. But you know, bonds may not may no longer fill that role. What what uh, do you in this new world of inflationary? What what is a natural hedge? Do you you know people talk glowingly of bonds as the positive carry put? It's the it's essentially a put, uh, you know, a hedge that pays me money because it's it's a bond. Um, do you is you know, what do you see if any a hedge? I know I, NFL doesn't really do a lot of um, hedging, but you know, what what about hedging? They're all imperfect. I mean, a bond is a put if you have a real yield. But obviously, right now, the 10 year, you're four and a half some odd percent of negative real yields. So that's going to be a really tricky environment if you, uh, that's not really a put because you're actually spending a lot of money each year to carry that trade in real terms. Um, other things people have looked at is doing like a CPI swap. Uh, or a 10-2 steepener where you bet on basically the 10-year rising relative to the two-year bond yield, which in inflation, all else equal, that should happen. Consequently, right now, you're seeing the two-year rise more than the 10, even though we're, we're experiencing inflation because the market's saying it's going to be worse for two years and then moderate. So the reason I went through all these, and then obviously there's tips, which are 
pretty heavily flawed in my opinion, just kind of given the payout nature, the way that they're structured and where inflation break-evens are today relative to nominal yields. So anyway, all those areas of kind of conventional hedges, if you will, uh, have huge detriments. But the biggest problem is they're all a binary bet. Either you're right or you're wrong. If you're right, you make a little bit of money in most cases. If you're wrong, you lose everything or most of your money. Where we want something where it's not a binary bet and you can do just fine if there's not runaway inflation or you have status quo type of macro backdrop. So, you know, you, you kind of need to, based on your level of conviction, based on where you kind of believe things are and where your risk tolerance is, decide, do you want to make that big levered binary bet or do you want something where it can, you can kind of own it throughout a cycle and get this complementary exposure that positively correlates to inflation? So you're, you're saying you have, INFL has equity beta as well. You're investing in high quality companies. So even if your inflation thesis doesn't play out, that it still will prove okay. Whereas if you buy tips or if you buy a 10-2 steepener or CPI swap, a long-term uh, put on a, on a treasury bond or something, that, that only pays out unless a certain uh, series of things happen which may not happen. Exactly. And look, I, I think that's the one thing that people just have to realize today is you have to accept equity market risk. And the world of finance kind of looks at risk in terms of volatility. But in order to actually benefit from inflation, you need to accept that type of volatility because there just are no answers in the fixed income world. And all of these different types of derivatives have their own flaws. And so if you have a view on inflation being secular you want to find what is going to have inflationary pressure, but then find a high quality business where you can be comfortable owning it for one, three, five, seven, ten years. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish here. Yeah, and I should explain a 10 2 steepener is essentially you know, uh, betting that uh, 10 year rates will go up at, at, relative to two year rates. So it's a, that the yield curve, uh, which is reflects like. Uh, how the price of money over a variety of maturities is typically upward sloping, you're betting that it will get steeper, upward slope. A CPI swap, I don't know a lot about it, but it's essentially a, a derivative that bets on the consumer price index, which is a, you know, uh, the, how inflation is measured, you know, the most common uh, variety. So James, we talked about some direct uh, beneficiaries from inflation. What about indirect beneficiaries? What, what are these sorts of companies? Sure. So the, the financial exchanges, the brokerages, but then some other good examples would be things like data and research companies. And the beauty of these is they really allow you to get access to sectors that are inflationary, but you never see in a, quote, hard asset or real asset portfolio or commodity portfolio. So in healthcare, contract research, where you're doing all the early stage uh, safety assessment and discovery. So basically through their lab work, they have a network of databases of information of flow of throughput in those labs where they can do it cheaper and faster than all of the incumbents. So to the extent there's inflation in the healthcare sector, it's a really nice mousetrap to capture inflationary pressures where the volume can really go through that can go up a lot. Pricing can go up, but your variable expenses aren't really there. Um, some, others, some other data companies might have access to automotives, industrials, metals and mining, credit markets, where, again, databases with 30, 50, 80, 100 years of data. So you're subscribing to that database. So the company flicks a switch. You get the data. Their incremental cost, they might have to pay a salesman a little bit more money. And then they have the research team and the analytics team just updating the database continuously. So again, really scalable to the extent that those markets kind of get inflationary trends and there's a lot more interest and there's a lot more demand in those markets. And that's why I really like the indirect beneficiaries because they allow us to really broaden our net and capture a lot of the unique facets of inflation that you don't get in traditional funds that are allocated purely towards real estate, commodities, infrastructure, so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm uh, amused that you use the term mousetrap because I actually believe your largest holding, uh, Charles Rivatory Labs, uh, <laughs> they, they do have some uh, mice for, for testing purposes, right? Can you, can you talk about why uh, what Charles River Labs does and why is it the biggest holding in your ETF? So it's the biggest holding as a function of performance. So there's probably seven or 10 positions that were initiated between a four and a 5% weight. Uh, Charles River's done extremely well this year. A lot of it's been through performance. Uh, 
the main business that they have, and I'll get to the business you're alluding to, um, is again, this, this safety assessment and discovery. So believe it or not, Charles River at some stage of the product uh, of, of drug discovery, therapeutic, biologics, um, at some point of this, of the life cycle, 80% of FDA approvals over the last three years, Charles River has touched. And this is not a huge company. It's about a $20 billion company. So a lot of room for them to run, both through kind of bolt-on acquisitions, but also market shares. As again, I said, they do this early stage and critical function cheaper and faster. One of the, the core business, actually, excuse me, let me rephrase, the legacy business that the platform was built on is what they call research models. That's uh, politically correct uh, 2021 language for highly engineered uh, genetic, uh, genetically modified rodent models. And like it or not, it's absolutely critical to saving human lives worldwide. And again, I mentioned it's, it's a very profitable but increasingly small business that Charles River has. But again, that database and that network of basically having these research models, it's taken them decades to create these the amount of iterations that they have, it's almost impossible to compete with them. And their pricing power is incredibly strong because you basically have to use them. So again, I'm not really focused on that business because it's not as scalable. The other sides of the business are what drive the thesis. But again, that is part of the business. And okay, I'm glad you explained that the reason it's the biggest part of the ETF is just because of performance. And perhaps some viewers can relate if they made a 5% allocation to Bitcoin or something that now is a 20% allocation because it just outperformed so much. Good, good problem to have. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. James, I want to ask you, what are characteristics that you can identify that makes a company benefit from inflation like if you if you're just putting the um capital intensity or you know aside just on the top line what do you look for that makes you say hmm this company can pass on inflation and you know what when you're going through a 10k or something says ah no i do not think that this can and like set you know setting aside discount rates and, and, ev and everything purely looking at the microeconomic level if there's a spectrum of this can pass along really well and this can't sort of, you know, what companies fall into that spectrum and why? The real dynamic that you're trying to capture with companies that can truly benefit from inflation is first, you want to basically have a product that is finite and high quality, but with inelastic demand. So is it capacity constrained? Will you have pricing power? Will the pricing power go up with inflation? But then also, if there's basically if lower demand offsets your higher price, then you're basically in the same place. So you need something with fairly inelastic demand, meaning you're still going to eat chicken. You're still going to drive your car. You're still going to eat your home, excuse me, heat your home. So that's really what we want to kind of line up here is finding companies with are people still going to demand these products, even if there is higher prices. So I take it that all of the companies in your in, in INFL are on that side of the spectrum where they can, um, as you perceive it, you know, pass on those prices. You know, without naming any names, what are some uh, companies or sectors where you think their ability to pass on prices is very weak because demand is very elastic? So it's not chicken. It's not. It's not. You know, everyone has to eat. Everyone has to you know uh, live somewhere. But what are some things that people just don't need to do? You know, the biggest the biggest pressure point is always in consumer discretionary. So how strong is your brand? How great is your pricing power? And, and you're starting to see it with some of these COVID darling stocks where I think some people confuse what the business models really were. But something like Peloton, obviously at different price points, how many people have enough money to buy the bike and then pay the subscription? So, you know, very elastic demand there, especially in a recession, I would imagine you're going to see huge churn, meaning a lot of people that are turning off that subscription. Hospitality. What is the demand both of business and leisure travel? Uh, restaurants. It's for a lot of Americans, it's an extravagance to go out for a meal at a restaurant, especially kind of a sit down, not quick service restaurant. So uh, hotels, obviously. So airlines. A lot of these are the areas where you take for granted if, if you're fortunate enough to kind of use these things on a regular basis that a lot of people, they say, hey, I'm going to pay my mortgage. I'm going to pay my cell phone bill. I'm going to heat my house and I'm going to eat. 
then whatever's left over is what's left over. Maybe you'll buy some clothes. If there's nothing left over, you know, is the, can you justify an iPhone for 1200 bucks? Can you justify you know, going to a nice restaurant for a hundred bucks? Can you justify going on a, on a plane for 400 bucks? That's where inflation gets tricky, especially if the wage, uh, the wage, the wage inflation continues to not keep up with CPI inflation. Mm. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about that. Uh, real personal income, that is income after inflation is actually negative uh, for uh, a series of, of months this year. What do you make of that? Some people saying it's going to crimp demand because people don't have enough money. They're, they're making so much more money, but the prices of what they have to, to live with are so much higher. Um, to what degree do you think that will crimp demand? Yeah, and I think that's the biggest argument, at least that has merit from the transitory or disinflation crowd is just technology is inherently somewhat disinflationary. I think you can argue to what extent. And that's really manifested itself where labor, unskilled manual labor in particular, has, ke- has not kept pace anywhere remotely close with CPI, PPI, cost of living types of measures. And I think COVID actually is going to is going to tilt that back into balance where you see more job openings than there are unemployed right now. And a big part of that is people walking away from the labor force. Um, a big part of that are I think there's two big dynamics here and there's a lot of data to support this one people in their 60s just walking away and retiring early saying, I'll make it work. I'll go to Florida. I'll stretch my money a little bit longer. My 401k is looking great. Uh, my pension's looking great. I'm done. The other is households with dual work with dual uh, both parents working. So, can you get childcare? Is childcare inordinately expensive? Are you comfortable with comfortable with the safety protocols? Uh, are you going into a workplace where you're comfortable with kind of where safety is as this thing continues to evolve? So, losing all this labor from the labor force is actually shifting uh, the power back to the labor, and I think that you've seen a lot of this political and social unrest worldwide. I think that's a big part of it is this, this battle between capital and labor and labor seems like it's starting to get their day. And that's going to be, you know, a tricky dynamic because it's pro inflationary, but it's also negative for profit margins. Yeah. It's, it's so complicated. Uh, the, the battle between capital and labor capital definitely had its, its day, uh, you know, for the past 40 years, but a lot of signs that the, the labor market, uh, is very strong, uh, you know, arguably the, the strongest it's been um, in, in 40 years. So we actually saw that uh, U.S. jobless claims are plunged uh, to the lowest level in 52 years since 1969. Um, can you talk about that sort of uh, wage price spiral that defined 1970s inflation? And to what degree you, th- you think we'll see that in this decade? And as you say, wages going up, but profit margins going down as well. How's that going to impact the investment landscape? You haven't really seen, but you've seen more and more companies every quarter with earnings reports. You can kind of do a word search for inflation, costs of goods sold, but then also labor costs. And right now, all of the leverage is with labor. So hourly workers from chains like CVS to McDonald's to Amazon to basically across the gamut are able to extract higher and higher wages. And quite frankly, in many cases, they deserve it, where these companies are earning huge uh, profit margins. But if they can actually just get a big reset, so they've basically been marginalized for, as you mentioned, 40 years. If this low tier, this lower income bucket can just get a one-time catch-up, that's going to be really inflationary. And when labor has that negotiating dynamic, that money, the propensity to spend of, of a household that's below median income is infinitely higher than a house that a household that's in the top 1% of the income bracket. So empowering these people, putting money in their pockets, that's what goes into the real economy. That's where consumption is. That's where the propensity to spend is. And so you can have this self-fulfilling uh, cycle where, again, in the 70s, you had this huge rise of standard and li- standard of living through the labor force and through people where they were kind of marginalized and weren't able to have these higher incomes. And that's what has this self-reinforcing dynamic. Many workers, James, are leaving the workforce. Uh, 4.4 million workers, a record number, uh, left the workforce last month. So many are just saying, I don't want out. You know, I'm I'm out of Dodge. Uh, And there are some people saying that that's deflationary. And 
I, you know, I am of the view that if 4.4 million people are fired, that's incredibly deflationary because those people, they need a job. They're willing to accept a pay cut. Likewise, but if people 4.4 million are quitting their job, that could be inflationary because they're saying, no, the clearing price for my labor is higher than what I'm getting. So I'm, I'm out. Uh, what, do you, what, you know, what, what do you make of that recent statistic? Yeah, so that, that logic, which I've seen a lot of people use, I think is missing a critical fact uh, variable. A lot of the people leaving the labor force, as I mentioned before, are 60, 65 plus. They're not big consumers by definition. They're basically living the rest of their life off of a fixed, off of a fixed number. Obviously, the really wealthy are going to basically distribute that to, to future generations. But again, that's not where you're worried about consumption. But to the extent a, a medium wage job, somebody who's 65 leaves and heads down to Florida and a 26 year old can get a big benefit. And they're buying houses, they're buying cars, they're buying things for their children, things like that. So I think it's actually the opposite when you look at the demographics of that shift in labor. Mm. James, I'm looking through the characteristics of INFL as a portfolio, and uh, the price to book is lower than the uh, S&P 500, 2.8 relative to 6.1 for the S&P 500. So the uh, book value is, is sort of the, the liquidation value, uh, if, if you will, of a company. So it's cheaper on that. It's cheaper on price to revenue. It's cheaper on price to free cash flow. It has lower debt to capital and higher profit margins. So my question, that looks pretty good. I'll follow those statistics. My question for you is, what are you sort of sacrificing? You know, it, it, let's say, let's take, uh, let, let's uh, believe that the adage that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Sort of what, what free lunch are you, are you giving out in order to achieve that, that high level of uh, uh, profitability and, and value? I would argue, and my colleagues, Steve Bregman, Murray Stahl, have done far more work in this than I have. But based on their work, I would argue there is a free lunch because of passive and index strategies. So thank you, iShares and State Street, for my free lunch. Because with passive investing, everybody's ignoring these types of companies. So I'm able to buy higher quality, less risky, better businesses that are cheaper than the market because of that dynamic. And so the way that indices are constructed, they ignore a lot of these businesses. Also, you can throw in the fact that there's ESG, so people don't necessarily want to invest in some of the these these minerals companies and, and, the, and these metals companies. But again, I would posit, well, we've enjoyed a great standard of living, and why are we going to basically take these away from people in non-OECD countries that basically still rely on all of these things for their daily lives? Uh, the third factor is that if you don't take the time to understand the businesses and just look at gig sectors, an exchange is a far different business than a financial, which was traditionally looked at as a money center bank or an a, a insurance company. An energy royalty company is a step change difference from an upstream oil and gas company. Um, so again, fewer people looking at these opportunities, understanding the difference. But I think this is also the opportunity is that if we're even remotely right in our thesis, ultimately more and more people are going to pay attention and take a look at these businesses, understand them for what they are. And I think they're just far too cheap. So you can benefit from growth in free cash flow, but then also multiples that do properly reflect the quality and growth of these companies. Yeah, the, the dynamic with passive investing that you alluded to earlier, uh, that, as I understand it from, from uh, the co-founder of Horizon Kinetic, Steve Bregman, is that funds like iShares that have these huge ETFs, they need stocks that have certain qualities, like a minimum level of, of trading, a minimum level of volume, so that they can uh, easily go in and out of the ETF when, when people buy the ETF. And so that companies that don't match that uh, requirement will, will serially be undervalued. I actually think I'm, hopefully I'm lucky enough to be interviewing uh, Steve Bregman uh, in December. So the viewers definitely uh, stay out for that. Um, James, you talked about non-OECD countries. What I'm noticing is absent from your portfolio is uh, really any emerging markets, you know, United States, Canada, Australia, uh, but, you know, close to, uh, you know, 80% of your holdings are in the United States and Canada. Why is that the case? A lot of these business models don't really exist or they're highly nuanced in emerging markets. So to be fair, there are exchanges that are publicly traded in EM markets. So there's a Bursa in Brazil, in Malaysia, in a lot of markets like that. And you know they're, they're a little bit too segmented in what products they trade. Um, but generally, I don't want to sacrifice quality. So I want really high quality compounding businesses that give me exposure to the inflationary areas that I've identified. 
And going to Brazil, very intensive in iron ore production and minerals and agriculture. I think I can get more efficient, less risky exposure going and develop market stocks that access those same variables, which isn't to say that I don't think that Brazil is going to be a good investment or there's good companies there. Just kind of based on what I'm trying to accomplish in my fund, I just I just haven't found anything that justifies the added risk of kind of going into those markets yet. Is buying gold the physical commodity? Is that an inflation hedge, and or is it an inflation beneficiary? And then the same thing for Bitcoin: is buying Bitcoin an inflation hedge, and or is it an inflation beneficiary? I would call them both beneficiaries because again. What are you basing inflation on? All of inflation is relative to the purchasing power of a certain currency. Let's just use now the dollar as the reserve currency for the world. But for all intents and purposes, we can use all um, money or all big developed market currencies. So basically, that's the euro, the dollar, the yen, the pound. Probably those are the only big liquid enough names. You can't. The franc isn't really liquid enough, and Nobody trades the ruble or the yuan outside of the domestic markets. But I think all of these have the same structural issues where they're being debased. The U.S. is not unique. In some sense, the U.S. is better off than a lot of those countries. But I think all, again, going back to my example before about uh, elastic versus inelastic demand, finite assets are going to appreciate relative to all of these currencies, whether it be gold or Bitcoin. I think particularly today, there's a lot of really fascinating aspects about Bitcoin that make it very attractive if we do continue down this path of debasement. And there's equally compelling arguments for some people with gold. I think they serve different purposes. Uh, and I think there's a lot of nuances between them. I hate the comparison of calling Bitcoin digital gold, but I see a lot of merit in both as a beneficiary, not so much a hedge. What would you say is a hedge? Yeah, that's tough, again, because you're you're getting back into that world where in the textbook definition, you want something that is going to have a payout scenario that goes up with inflation. So think about it with in the stock market. If you were to hedge the market, you buy a put. So you spend X amount of money buying a put where if the, where if the S&P goes down below this level, your payout scenario begins. So in that classic sense, again, you have to go back to some sort of a derivative that's linked to CPI because tips aren't going to do it. I don't think a 10-2 steepener is going to do it. So now you're getting into kind of the asset eclectic world of derivatives and swaps where you really need to know what you're doing and understand how to do it because it's not a one-for-one one to bet on rates or to, or to bet on other types of variables. So it's tricky. And that's why I want to be so careful about a hedge because when I think of a hedge, I think of an insurance policy. So my homeowner's insurance is a hedge on something happening to my house to find a parallel of that for inflation is almost impossible. What, what about sort of companies where inflation is kind of baked into the cake, where like a Visa takes, I don't know, 20 basis points of every transaction. If it's a $100 transaction, they get 15 cents. If it's a $200 transaction because of inflation, then they get 30, uh, uh, 40 cents, it's 20 cents. Um, you know, would we characterize those as inflation hedge? I mean, do you like those sort of businesses? And, or maybe do you think that their inflation beneficiary capacity is just a little too weak for, for INFL? No, you know, those are a great example. And I think something that we haven't really touched on that I'm, I'm glad that we've kind of, uh, kind of found our way here is valuation. So it's great. Find a hard asset that you think is going to be inflationary. Find a great business model that's going to benefit. But if you pay through the nose for that business, that interest rate sensitivity can do a lot more harm than any inflation beneficiary. And you can lose a lot of money just throwing darts at good businesses in inflationary sectors. And I think people are learning that the hard way, particularly the past two days and throwing darts at digital economy stocks over the past two years, trading at 100 times revenue. So Visa and MasterCard in particular, you know, I've been wrong. I thought they've been really expensive for a long time. But something happened the other day where Amazon is going to stop accepting, um, I believe it's Visa, it could be MasterCard payments in the UK. And I think this could be a shot across the bow where their costs have gone down for decades and they're still charging intercharge fees to merchants, in some cases upwards of 3%. And I think people are going to start pushing back against that because all of their expense structure has gone down, but they're pushing higher and higher prices. And it's either hurting small merchants or you could argue it's pushed on to consumers. 
And I hate the argument where people say, oh, well, the credit card holders benefit because of the, because of their rewards program. That's patently false. Chase is the one who gives me my, my rewards for my Chase credit card because they're the ones that benefit if I basically have to pay them interest and basically holding all the collateral. It's not Visa and MasterCard who are just government sanctioned monopolies that were spun off out of the financial institutions back during the financial crisis. So very different dynamic. And I kind of went off on a tangent there, but the thing I want to focus on is price. So I think that the price there plus the regulatory concerns, not something that's in the portfolio. So INFL does not own any Bitcoin because that's not what it's set out to do uh, as a portfolio, but you're a co-portfolio co manager of another internet fund for Horizon Kinetics. And there, the biggest holding by a considerable margin is the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Can you talk about why you own the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust as opposed to, uh, let's say, uh, you know, physical Bitcoin, maybe you can't do that, or the new Bitcoin ETFs like BITO? Um, do you like the fact that it's trading at such a large discount to its net asset value? Sure. So let me give you a little bit of history with the internet fund. So Horizon Value, eclectic firm that was started in 1994 by people that I would really consider Buffett and Munger-esque in how they think about the world. I think they've created their own framework that is based in that fundamental philosophy. So it's like, why, how, how in the heck would these guys start an internet fund in the late 90s? But they saw the potential of the internet and they saw what it could enable, and they really invested in companies that benefited from the internet, not your pets.com of 1998. So that was really the first iteration of the internet. And I have to give 100% of the credit here to the lead PM, Murray Stahl, for recognizing the next iteration of the internet could very well be blockchain and the technologies that it enables. And back when he first invested, there was no such thing as custody. I mean, banks would basically, I mean, their heads would spin if you even talked about Bitcoin back when he started investing in Bitcoin in the internet fund. So the only way to do it is to get a QCIP. So a QCIP is basically an identifier where you can put it into a uh, public uh, mutual fund like the internet fund. And, you know, it's such a large position today because the cost basis was under a percent, if I, if, if I oh, believe wow. correctly. And so that's all appreciation. And if you notice kind of the orientation of the internet fund today, it's getting more into these companies that benefit from the blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin ecosystem, whether it's mining uh, or other types of intermediaries. And it's something I'm looking at very closely for the INFL fund. But again, I, I really want to understand the economics, the asset light and the valuations as things like BACT have recently come public, Coinbase coming public, a lot of mining names coming public. I'd love to see Kraken get public and things like that, but it's a really exciting time. And, you know, the Internet Fund's doing a lot of inter interesting things within that mandate. And I'm looking at it very closely for both products. James, final question for you is I know that you've uh, ordered, uh, that you have uh, Sidney Homer's A History of Interest Rate, which is a book I don't even think I could carry, let alone read. <laughs> you're, you've got some fine books at the Horizon Kinetics Library. If you had to make a book recommendation for our audience other than that huge tome by Sidney Homer, what would it be? Oh, um, there's so many good books. I'm trying to think in terms of, uh, of inflation. Uh, you know, let me actually give a little bit of a different answer. Someone that I just have followed for years and is fascinating is Russell Napier. Um, I think you might have even interviewed him, but he's just fascinating. He was a deflationist. And one of the things I respect so much about Russell is that he changed his mind. And that's so hard to do because people, are, people especially of that esteemed career and in intelligence, the ability to change your mind is so important. I really respect how he's done it and a lot of the reasons why he's done it are the things that I've talked about. And he gets really into the weeds about central bank intelligence, but he offers a free class online. So you can just Google it and it is invaluable kind of what he teaches about the history of financial markets. And if you really want to understand some of the things that we just glossed over today, that's an incredible free resource from somebody who's just such an original, unique thinker. So I, I'd say I'll give you a, a bit of a interesting side answer there. Yeah, well, that was a fascinating answer. I couldn't agree more. I think Russell is brilliant. He called uh, disinflation and now he's, he's calling inflation a fantastic macro track record. Uh, James, you were about to escape from the interview, but because you mentioned Russell Napier, that reminded me about <laughs> Napier's thoughts on quality, specifically that 
in a disinflationary world, you want to own Coca-Cola, you want to own Google, you know, brand names. And it's the, you know, it's the um, iron miners that no one ever heard of. Those are the stocks that go bankrupt. But in an inflationary times, actually, the junkier companies can tend to, to do well. So could I make the argument that the fact that you, the companies in IF, NFL have a relatively lower debt to capital ratio than the S&P 500, could that be a negative? Because you actually want indebted companies because what they owe, fiat money, the dollar, is going to be worth so much less. Yeah, and it all depends on the degree of inflation. So if we have really intense inflation, I'm talking sustained 6% plus, go with the lowest quality because that debt is eventually going to get debased. And you know, I, I was joking the other day, I, I had a meeting with an extremely wealthy family office in Europe, and one of the proprietors said, look, I'm thinking about buying this $20 million house in the Swiss Alps because the bank's willing to give me 100% loan to value at some outrageously low interest rate. And he's like, I'm going to pay them back the equivalent of a loaf of bread to get my mansion. As, and I thought, I was like, yeah, you're right. If inflation is going to be that pernicious, debt is basically going to be washed away. And that's kind of what the global governments need. Uh, but if it's not going to be that aggressive, debt could actually be really damaging, especially if inflation causes kind of this rate back up and has economic consequences, if the economy then kind of stubble, stumbles or sputters, then debt can become a really big problem. So again, what's your risk profile? What's your timeline? What's your liquidity like to see something through? That kind of depends on, do you go with a loaf of bread thesis or the quality kind of inflation compounder thesis? Yeah, lots to think about. Well, James, it's been a total pleasure having you on Forward Guidance. Have to have you back on. Again, uh, the uh, ticker is INFL. Thank you, everyone, for watching and have a good time.